Uh, would you take your Bible and turn with me to Luke chapter number 10? Luke chapter number 10. And we'll stand just one more time for the reading of God's Word. Luke chapter number 10. That was a great program. I'm jealous of any of the uh, elementary age students that were able to be an astronaut. That's what I always wanted to be dressed up as. But I was always Billy Sunday. And... Uh, <laughs> Not an astronaut, so I was always jealous of that, but they did a great job. I brought with me um, some millennial Thanksgiving tweets to help you understand millennials. And so this is kind of uh, the mind of a millennial, especially around Thanksgiving time. Uh, this first one says, One week until I pretend to be grateful for turkey when I know the same grocery store had steak. <laughs> I asked what to bring for Thanksgiving this year, and my mom said it was up to me, so I'm bringing a wireless router. Thankful for Happy Thanksgiving mass text from people I haven't heard from since last year's Happy Thanksgiving mass text. <laughs> Any of you gotten one of those before? Okay, get ready for them. They're coming. <laughs> I'd rather spend Thanksgiving with a serial killer than someone who says, the diet starts tomorrow on Thanksgiving. <laughs> Here's another one. My grandma was not pleased with my Yelp review last year, but I wasn't impressed with her lackluster cranberry sauce. Hope she stepped it up. Next one. I love Thanksgiving. Can't wait to slave for hours over a meal my kids will rudely reject in front of my relatives who are judging my parenting. <laughs> Here's a good one for after Thanksgiving. Recipe for the best post-Thanksgiving breakfast. Make a bowl of organic oatmeal next. Throw the oatmeal in the garbage and eat two slices of pie. <laughs> you might want to remember that one. Here's a good one. Please remember, uh, let me skip this one. Uh, uh, look I'm saving that one for last. That's my favorite. Look at the people in the room next to you. This is for Thanksgiving Day. Tomorrow, one of them will die in a Target. <laughs> and this is my favorite one. Please remember the spirit of the holidays and turn your phones the right way when recording any Black Friday fights. So, just, some, just some thoughts from the mind of a millennial. Let's pray and jump into this. Uh, or let's read the scripture, pray and jump into it, rather. Luke chapter number 10, verse number 38, says this, And Jesus answered, and said unto her, Martha, Martha, thou art careful and troubled about many things, but one thing is needful. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for this opportunity to gather together and read from your word. I pray that you would show us some truths from your word, and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. According to the Healthline Corporation, 62 Americans, 62% uh, of Americans describe their stress level during the holidays as somewhat or very elevated during the holiday season, while only 10% reported no stress during the season at all. And there's a lot of reasons for this. Perhaps it's the travel. This is supposed to be one of the busiest travel seasons in a long time. Uh, over 50 million Americans are expect expected to travel this week. That's up uh, 3.4 percent. According to USA Today, this is supposed to be the busiest travel week in over 10 years. AAA rated Los Angeles as number one uh, worst traffic in America this season. So maybe it's the travel. If you've got travel plans, maybe that's stressing you out. Uh, maybe it's the cooking. Uh, the, according to the National Fire Protection Association, fire departments in America responded to 17 uh, 1,760 home cooking fires on Thanksgiving last year. Just one day, 1,700 fires. Uh, so maybe it's the cooking that has you stressed out. Uh, maybe it's the idea of talking about politics at the Thanksgiving table. There was a Stanford economic survey that was done last year, and they said that the, because of the election season last year, that politically divided families reported a shorter dinner together by 20 or 30 minutes shorter than what they usually have because of politics. And so if you go online and you just type into the key, keyboard, you know, stress and Thanksgiving, it, you'll find a, a ton of uh, suggested tips for avoiding the stress. And I did that just yesterday and this one article came up, how to survive Thanksgiving when politics loom large. And I'm like, okay, so I went to the first point. The first point says just don't talk about politics. That's how you survive policy. Don't do it. Don't talk about it. And then I skip down to number three. This is on NBC's website. Des designate a politics zone. Like, this doesn't make any sense. So don't talk about politics, but then designate a place in your house where you talk about politics. Okay. This doesn't make any sense to me, but maybe this is why everyone's stressed out. Or maybe, maybe you're like me. Sometimes it's like just the fact that you don't have enough time. 
Uh, that stresses you out. Like if I just had time to, to just do one more thing, one more thing, if I just had enough time. And so, and, and maybe you're sitting here tonight, you're like, man, this is stressing me out just thinking about all this. Okay, well, let's turn our attention to this passage uh, tonight. And before us, we read of a stressful situation that involves an out-of-town guest, a special meal, and some family tension. So there's definitely some elements in this passage that we can relate to. But more than that, this passage instructs our hearts. And so the first thing that we see in this passage, in verse number 38, is that Jesus enters the story. Jesus enters the story. It says this in verse number 38. Now it came to pass, as they went, that he, me Jesus, entered into a certain village, and a certain woman named Martha received him into her house. So the reason we read of this certain village in the first place was because Jesus in, enters into the story. And I know this is simple, but the reason we're reading about this house and this city is because Jesus was there because Jesus entered into this story. Uh, that Luke is not really concerned about the, uh, the chronology of this event, but uh, John tells us that uh, this house was located in Bethany, which is about two miles away from Jerusalem. So he enters this house into Bethany, and it's a familiar house. This is the house, house of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. And this was probably the first of potentially many visits by our, our Savior into this home. And we read that Martha receives him into her home, which, which is great that anyone would receive Jesus like that. But what is just unfathomable is the fact that Jesus would come in the first place. And so I, I, think it's, I think it's healthy for us as believers to just pause during the Thanksgiving season and be thankful that Jesus not only entered this story, but he entered our story. And in fact, our story, the story of redemption, is found in Jesus. And so Jesus is received by Martha into this home. On Thanksgiving Eve in 2003, President George Bush conducted a stunning mission under enormous secrecy. The, uh, the Air Force ground crew was told that Air Force One would be conduct conducting a maintenance flight as it departed. What they didn't know was that the President of the United States was secretly driven to the airport in a civilian car while wearing a ball, ball cap and a work coat. With, uh, with just a few of his staff members on board, and, and not even his wife, Laura, and his parents knew what was happening. You may remember President Bush flew overnight over to Baghdad, Iraq, the first American president to ever fly to Baghdad and land in Baghdad, and it was during wartime. And the purpose of this visit was to serve a Thanksgiving meal to our troops. And, and one of the soldiers was, was quoted as saying, here was this man, our president, came all the way around the world spending 17 hours on an airplane and landing in the most dangerous airport in the world just to spend a few hours with his troops. It was a great moment, and I will never forget it. This was no ordinary visitor. Now, this is a heartwarming story for sure, but it pales in comparison to what Jesus did. See, Jesus enters this story, but he enters our story, and he comes, and he was no ordinary visitor. And what sets Jesus apart was, first of all, Jesus brings love. Uh, Jesus uh, loved this family, and Jesus loves us. In John chapter number 11, it says that Jesus uh, loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. And so Jesus, he comes with him, but he brings this divine love. And uh, Ephesians chapter 3, verse 19 says, And to know the love of Christ, which passeth knowledge. It's hard for us to comprehend what would cause Jesus to come, and why he would come, and why he would love us the way he does. It's hard for our minds to comprehend this, but he loves us, and he brings this love, but Jesus brings life, particularly to this home. I mean, literally, Lazarus at one point is raised from the dead. Jesus brings life. On one occasion, Jesus is talking with Martha, and he's, or he's speaking to Mary, and he says, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? And Martha, she responded, Yea, Lord, I believe that thou art the Christ, the Son of God, which had come into the world. 1 Corinthians 15, 57 says, But thanks be to God, which gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. So first, we can pause tonight and be thankful that Jesus entered the story. Jesus enters not only this story, but he enters our story. And he came, and he came with love, and he brought love, and he, and he brought life, everlasting life, through his sacrifice on the cross. So we see first in this passage that Jesus enters the story. But then something interesting happens next. We're going to observe that tensions escalate between the sisters. Tensions escalate between the sisters. Now, this is not supposed to happen. 
All right, so we just talked about the fact that Jesus came. Uh, the scripture teaches us in Ephesians that Jesus brings peace. So Jesus comes into a house, but now tensions are about to escalate. And it's not supposed to work that way. Uh, the same way, sometimes as Christians, we know uh, we're not supposed to worry, and then, then we do. Uh, or, or the same way, sometimes as, as uh, believers, that we, we, we know we're not supposed to be ungrateful. We know that we've been given way more than we deserve, and then we forget and neglect to express our gratitude. Uh, the same way that we as believers sometimes, we know that we're supposed to live a life of submission and surrender, but then we constantly try to take back our control. So why is this not working? See, Jesus is in, he's in the home. He's supposed to bring peace, but this home is, is, is not finding peace. There's, there's, there's tension. And so we'll, let's look at exactly went wrong, what went wrong. Look at verse number 39. It says this, And she had a sister, this is Martha, had a sister called Mary, which also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. So the first thing we find, we find Mary was focused in adoration, all right? So Mary's, uh, a lot of people think, uh, a lot of commentaries believe that Mary's the younger of the two sisters, and she's here at Jesus' feet, and he, she's focused listening to what Jesus is saying. Mary assumed the posture of a student. This, is, this happened frequently in biblical times, and, and even we can read biblical accounts where someone would come and sit at the feet of an instructor. Um, what is not so common is the fact that Jesus is speaking to Mary, who is a woman. Uh, uh, in the Jewish culture, this would never have taken place. But remember, Jesus, out of his heart, is love, and he brings love, and he brings life, and he's instructing Mary, and he's teaching Mary. And, and perhaps Mary had just finished washing Jesus' feet, or she's, she's there, but she's glued to Jesus. She's listening, and the word used to describe listening, it's, it's an ongoing listening. She's, she's hanging on to every word that Jesus speaks. And so Mary is here, and she's focused in this adoration. Uh, this was a familiar posture to Mary. In John chapter number 11, we read that Mary, when she, when she saw Jesus, she fell down at his feet. The next chapter says that Mary... Uh, took a pound of uh, ointment of spikenard, very costly, and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. So Mary, she's in this familiar posture where we often find Mary just sitting and listening. And that's about all she's doing. She's glued to every word that Jesus is speaking. She's sitting there and she's listening. I, I don't know about you, but uh, I, we live in such, I've noticed we've lived in such a fast-paced culture. I don't like to slow down. I don't like to stop to do anything. doesn't mean that I'm always productive, but a lot of times I'm running around doing one thing and another thing. Um, and our, our lives are marked with activity. We're busier than we've ever been. And the problem is what gets sacrificed in the business of our life is not our to-do list, but our hearts. So here is Mary. She's just sitting there. She's just listening. She's focused in adoration. But let's look at Martha, verse number 40. It says, but Martha was cumbered about with much serving. She was cumbered about much serving and came to him and said, Lord, dost thou not care that my sister hath left me to serve alone? Bid her therefore that she help me. Okay, so there's a little bit of tension about to happen here, and she's a little frustrated. The Bible says that she's cumbered, not a word that we use every day in our language, but she's cumbered. This means that uh, she's, she's drawn away. She's, she's distracted. She's being pulled apart in, in many directions. Uh, every once in a while, I try to help my wife in the kitchen every once in a while, uh, cook, and, and, and man, I can't keep track of all the bells and everything that I'm supposed to. I just can't do it, you know? Um, and, and maybe that's what Mary's, uh, Martha's experiencing here, that she's, she's being pulled in all different directions. She's distracted. So she's cumbered, but she's cumbered about with much serving. So she's doing something that's, that's good. She's serving. She's working. And it says that she came to him, all right? So she's She's, she's stressed out now, so she comes to Jesus, not to cast all her care upon him, but to lodge a complaint. She's upset, all right? So she's, she's upset. She comes to Jesus to, to complain. Um, I, I saved one, one of these Thanksgiving tweets for this part of the message. Uh, this tweet reads, My wife and I each had a role in the Thanksgiving dinner. She cooked and I took a nap. It's called teamwork, <laughs> okay? I promise you I didn't write that, write that tweet, but... But, but maybe we think, uh, you know, maybe Mary has reason to be upset. You know, she's in there. She's doing all the work. Uh, Mary's out there just listening to Jesus. Maybe she should get in the kitchen and help Martha. And, and, and Martha's frustrated here. She's, she's frustrated. Uh, a quick note of caution. Christ-like 
humble service will not lead to a self-righteous attitude. When you're serving Christ out of a heart of humility, you won't look around and notice who's not serving. You'll keep your eyes focused on Jesus and, and, and love the fact that you get to serve Him. And so maybe there's this self-righteousness, like, I'm serving, she's sitting, she's not doing anything. So Martha, she's frustrated. And Martha, then she makes this accusation, and she says this to Jesus, dost thou not care? I think Jesus proved time and time again with this family that He cared and He loved for this family. And yet, he, she makes this accusation, Jesus, you don't even care. You see, what happens was she lost perspective. She lost perspective. Uh, she approached Jesus with a demanding heart rather than a listening heart. And she comes to him and says, bid her, kind of like when my daughter comes to me and says, will you tell Blair to do it this way? That, that's the way that Martha approaches Jesus. Jesus, will you tell Mary to come in the kitchen to come and help me? I'm being pulled in every direction here. And she, she's frustrated. And so the tent, Jesus arrives. This, this tension kind of uh, arises. But finally, Jesus provides us with an eternal perspective. So what does Jesus do? First thing he does is he calms Mary's spirit. Verse number 41. And Jesus answered and said unto her, Martha, Martha. So Jesus calms Martha's spirit. And Jesus answered and said unto her, Martha, Martha. Uh, Jesus spoke like this often. He said, Simon, Simon, and Saul, Saul. It was a way of getting attention. Without, he wasn't yelling. He wasn't being rude. He was saying, Mary, Martha, Martha, getting, getting her attention. And he's going he's gonna to teach her something here. Uh, so he, he calms Martha's spirit. But then next, he clarifies their priority. He helps to put things into perspective here. He says, thou art careful. And that word means means anxious. So she's, she's worried. She's anxious. And she's troubled. This, this is speaking about this emotionally distraught. So she's, she's anxious. She's, she's distraught about many things. She's pulled in all direction. And by the way, as we said, Martha was doing some good things. It's not like Martha was caught up in some, you know, in riotous living. No, she was serving. But in an abundance of her activity, she lost perspective of Jesus. Mary is sometimes referred to in this passage as Mary the devoted because we find Mary at the feet of Jesus. It's Mary the devotion, and her devotion is just so apparent in the way she's listening. But I don't think that Mary, Martha was any less devoted than Mary. You read through Scripture, Martha loved Jesus. Martha had a devotion for Jesus, but Martha was distracted in her service. One theologian said, it is unethical to make conclusions about Martha as less devoted. And so Martha, she loved Jesus. And this is what happens sometimes as believers, as Christians. We can get busy sometimes even doing, doing some, some good things. Maybe serving in good ways, but we've neglected the one thing that is most important. And so she loved Jesus, but she was distracted. The famous Boston pastor, Dr. A.J. Gordon, visited the World's Fair in Chicago. In the distance, he saw a man robed in bright, gaudy, oriental clothes who appeared to be laboriously turning the crank of a pump and thereby making a mighty flow of water. Gordon was impressed. He was impressed with this man's energy and his smooth motions as he, his obvious physical conditioning was allowing him to pump a tremendous amount of water. But as he walked closer, Gordon was surprised to discover that the man was actually made of wood. Instead of turning the crank and making the water flow, the flow of the water was actually turning the clank, crank and thereby making the wooden man move. And that's sometimes what can happen with us in service. We can get in this routine where we're serving, but then we lose our heart in service and we lose perspective and now we're frustrated with everything. And now maybe we even reach this point where we, we, we're, we're self-righteous and we're accusing others of not even caring. She had lost perspective. She was, she was still cranking the pump, so to speak. She was going through the motions, but her heart was not there. And so her day was marked with activity, but her heart was inattentive to what mattered most. She was at the mercy of her own activity. And, that, and that's when Jesus says here in verse number 42, but one thing is needful. One thing is needful. Now note, a closeness to Jesus will reveal what really matters. A closeness to Christ will clarify our priorities. We find this elsewhere in Scripture. David wrote, One thing have I desired of the Lord that I will seek after Him. Paul said, This one thing I do. So the closer you get to Christ, 
the more clearly your priorities will, will appear uh, to you. And so one thing is needle, need, needful. One thing is needful. If we're not careful, our lives can be full with so much activity, but none of which is drawing us any closer to Christ. Sometimes we run around thinking, if I just had you know, the time to just do one more thing, just, just a few more things, but the instruction for our hearts tonight is that there's just one thing. And that one thing is Jesus. And if you can make that one thing a priority, the other things begin to pale in comparison to what really matters. So what's this one thing? So, so Luke, he, he placed this passage, not chronologically, but, but really in, in a great spot in Scripture because you read to the next chapters. And by the way, uh, all Scripture is inspired, but the chapter and verse uh, divisions came later. You read the next account, and you find Jesus teaching his disciples how to pray. It's that one thing. That communion with God, meeting with God, and abiding with Him, and worshiping Him, and making a priority of coming to Him. And so, Jesus, He, he, he first he, clear, he calms Martha's spirit, and then He clarifies the priority. He says there's one thing that is needful, and then He confirms Mary's decision. He says this, And Mary hath chosen that good part. There's one thing, and Mary hath chosen that, that good part. She chose what was better. She chose the better option to calm her heart and her spirit and sit at the feet of Jesus. Mary made the better decision. So, is the point here to just relax and to never do anything? Uh, let someone else be busy. That's not the point at all. Remember, remember Luke, he, point, he placed this passage strategically. The passage before is the parable of the Good Samaritan, which teaches many lessons. One of them is if your faith is real and your love is real, you'll act upon it. Jesus, his ministry was marked by urgency and action. So the point's not to sit back and just do nothing, but the point is to make sure your heart is aligned before you serve. One pastor said it this way, the ideal situation would be to have a church full of members that resemble the hearts and action of Mary and Martha. Serving and active, but with the right heart. And then, and then Jesus finishes with this. He says, and this thing, he said, which shall not be taken away from her. This is the point with activity. Not all activity is of eternal significance. And, and here, this is important. Martha was attempting to be a good host. She loved Jesus. Her devotion to him was obvious. She was doing a lot of things, but the things that she were, was doing did not have any significant eternal value. And Jesus, he, he confirms Mary's decision by saying she chose what was eternally significant to do. And, and he says, then this shall not be taken away from her. Here's our problem as we approach the one thing. We see this one thing in Scripture, which is just to be with God, to listen to Him, to commune with Him, and to abide with Him. And we don't view this one thing as that big of a deal until it is. In 1998, NASA launched a, a, a rover that was intended to go to Mars. It took 11 months to, to, to finally arrive within orbit of, of Mars. And NASA and JPL, they all uh, sat with excitement as they would watch this, this climate probe land on Mars. But something began to go wrong as it became uh, closer and closer to the surface of the, the, the planet Mars. And, and they began to realize that it was dropping in altitude too quickly. And it actually entered into orbit about 100 miles lower than it should have, and it burned up. And this was a $193 million space probe that never even made it to, to the surface of the planet. And so, as you can imagine, there was, there was many uh, 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 different reviews that were trying to, conducted to try to figure out what went wrong. Well, they figured out what had gone wrong, and it was actually a pretty minor error. One of the subcontractors that NASA had hired performed their math calculations and their measurement calculations according to the imperial system of measurements while NASA had built the entire space probe according to the metric system. The math was right in the imperial system. The math was correct in the metric system. They just used the wrong system. And it seems like a little insignificant detail until it wasn't. And sometimes we think, uh, you know, spending time with, 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 with God, coming to His feet, listening, adoring, worshiping Him, praising Him, abiding with Him, I can get to that later. It's not such a big deal until it is. It's the one thing 
that's needful. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes.